the, the problem I want to talk about is here. This is the sun and the, this internal region here called the core is where the energy is generated by proton-proton collision and you have hydrogen that gets converted to helium and then it also emits uh, neutrinos and photons. And then as the energy travels outwards, um, then you have a region where the thermal energy is being uh, conveyed outwards through radiation. And at some point, as the radius becomes larger, the temperature drops, and not all the uh, gas is ionized, so radiation becomes inefficient. And you have the transport of energy from here on, which is about seven tenths of the radius outwards through the bodily motion of uh, fluid, just as you would imagine um, having um, happen in the atmosphere or what you might see in your kitchen if you boil the water on a stove. So it is this part of the sun's internal structure that I'm interested in, outwards of this radius, where the so-called convection of the fluid takes place that carries with it the thermal energy that is coming out um, from, from here eventually. So uh, it is of great interest for a number of reasons because what you see on the sun's surface, like uh, magnetic field loops and, and eventually the uh, solar spars, the sun spars and uh, properties related to that are thought to be related to convection. So I'll uh, make a remark or two on, on that, but that is not my major uh, topic. So in order to tell you a little bit more about what's happening in this um, business, I have to develop a few, uh, define a few parameters, and I do that here. So uh, I talk about an idealized version of what might be happening in the sun, just to get our bearings right, and then I'll go to describe what is happening in the sun itself. So here uh, is a box in which is a fluid of known properties is sitting. And these bottom and top walls are thermally conducting and the side walls are not conducting. It has a height h and d, uh, which is the diameter of this. So you maintain this bottom plate at a temperature delta t that is larger than the temperature of the top plate. You heat this or cool that, or you heat and cool it, et cetera. If delta T is small in some sense that we will quantify, then the, uh, the conduction, the transport of heat takes place by molecular conduction, and the temperature profile will be just linear. This is the thing you would learn in high school or earlier. And when delta T becomes large, then the fluid itself starts to move. And in fact, there are um, a certain conditions when the fluid patterns are really very regular, such as I have tried to show here, which is looking down into the, into the box. So these hexagonal-like structures, fluid comes out of these structures and then moves on to the periphery. But if you increase the delta T even further, this type of organized motion which is not the only type possible, this type of organized motion becomes chaotic and becomes what we call uh, turbulent. And uh, so that's the portion that I'm interested in, the part when the motion of the fluid here is turbulent and carries the heat from the bottom to the top. So the problem, one typical problem would be to maintain a certain temperature difference and ask, how much heat is capable of being transported from bottom to the top. So the fluid has a viscosity nu, thermal conductivity kappa, and the thermal expansion coefficient alpha. So how am I going to measure and tell you whether delta T is large or small? I have to normalize this delta T 
through some other properties of the fluid, and it's usually the so-called Rayleigh number. You may not want to remember all the definitions and so on, but basically when I say Rayleigh number, it's a measure of the temperature difference between the top and bottom, or in the case of the sun, between the, um, the beginning of the convection region to the top of the convection region. So the other parameters I have already uh, defined um, here. And uh, perhaps uh, one of the questions, as I said, you can ask is, I maintain a certain temperature difference delta T, and I ask how much heat is being transported from bottom to the top, and that is measured by the so-called Nusselt number. It's just the amount of heat transported normalized in a certain way. Another uh, thing, uh, all of which if I use, I will remind you what it is, uh, so you don't particularly have to pay too much attention memorizing it. There is the so-called Prandtl number, which is the ratio of the two diffusivities. Um, this is the viscosity and thermal diffusivity. And then, of course, there may be geometric effects, such as how wide things are compared to how high they are. And finally, I could set this thing in rotation around an axis like this, and then I can ask what is the parameter that characterizes the rotation, and this is the so-called Rossby number, which is a ratio of some characteristic velocity. For example, if you have a fluid parcel that rises because of buoyancy, the velocity of that can be this V, and this omega here is the rotation rate, and this could also be some other length scale than the height of the apparatus itself. So the main thing to remember is faster the rotation rate, smaller the Rossby number. That's the only thing that you will have to remember. So uh, that's the kind of uh, space in which uh, the, uh, any problem on convection could work. But on the, in the sun, we have so many peculiarities. For example, I plot the density um, of the fluid medium inside the sun as a function of the distance away from the radius. So we are sitting at the, at the, at the center of the sun, and then outwards, uh, this is the surface of the sun. And the convection region, as I said earlier, starts around 3 tenths of the radius, which is here, which uh, is marked by this line. So all of this region would be, um, I, I, I'm sorry, it should be 7 tenths from here on to this uh, radius outwards. But what you can see is that this has a certain, um, certain region where the density does not drop so rapidly, but towards the end, it drops rather precipitously. This may be uh, one or two uh, orders of magnitude. Each line here is one order of magnitude of density drop. But here, towards the edge of the uh, sun, uh, it is a very precipitous drop. So in fact, the convection region starting from 7 tenths outwards here has two parts, you might say. One part on the skin of the sun, which is like a, a percent or so of the skin of the, of the uh, sun's radius that you can actually observe, more or less. And then the rest of the, rest of the stuff where the density stratification is not as, as large. So I'll, uh, I'll skip this a bit more. Um, but let me say that on the surface of the sun, you can actually see what's happening through an optical telescope, for example. There's a picture that is taken uh, from this Swedish uh, solar telescope, one meter, not in Sweden, of course. And the, uh, the, this kind of pattern is what you see. A typical size of this pattern could be of the order of one megameter, which is a very large scale from human experience. And it lasts about 10, 10 minutes, and it uh, really moves about at a speed of the order of one kilometer per second. So this kind of stuff, um, which is, as I said, occupies about a 1% one, 1 of the radius of the sun, uh, which is still already very, very large since the uh, sun's radius is 700,000 uh, um, um, megameters, something like that. Um, then 
this, this kind of pattern, the Rayleigh number corresponding to this is not very large. It's uh, usually. Uh, That's right, yeah, 1,000 uh, uh, meters, uh, uh, megameter, 1,000 uh, uh, kilometers, yeah. So I have a, a movie of this, which I can uh, show. Um, so let's go here and view this full screen. So that's how, uh, of course, this is uh, not uh, on the time scale is um, much faster on the movie, but that's the kind of uh, things one sees, and these are called the granules. And uh, one understands what this is now more or less well. One knows what they are, not through experiments, because the fluid is very peculiar, the boundary conditions are very peculiar, the properties of the gas are not known uh, that in a way that you can actually um, do experiments with. But there are numerical simulations that people have performed. And the general consensus in the, in the field is that this part is uh, pretty well understood. Um, so I said here, Rayleigh numbers are well within experimental capabilities but very little can be translated directly from laboratory convection studies because the boundary conditions are not standard of the sort that you cannot create in the laboratory. Um, the state of the gas needs to be computed each at each step. And uh, therefore, not much experimental, but the direct numerical simulation, so-called, um, which solves the equations of motion on a computer, seems to produce results that agree with the experiments in terms of the lifetime of, the, of these granules and uh, how big they are and things of that sort. So let me say that that part is understood. Then the part that is not so well understood is this so-called deep convection that is going from 7 tenths of the radius of the sun to all the way to the skin of the sun, um, nearly 30% of the radius if you leave out the very last part. And that convection, just on the skin, skin the sun. That's what you can observe through optical telescope and things of that sort. This is something you cannot really observe, uh, although I will tell you how we may observe some part of it. So uh, it occupies, as I said, uh, nearly three tenths of the radius of the sun. And that's about that many kilometers. So that's a huge uh, distance, uh, which is uh, worth remembering. Uh, because the parameter range in the flow are very large. They, these parameters, like the Rayleigh numbers that I mentioned earlier, uh, would be very large. So uh, these, this is the Rayleigh number, which could be 10 to the power 22, which is a very large number. I can tell you how one computes that. It's a non-trivial thing to compute. So whenever such numbers are very large, what it means is that there are smaller and smaller scales in the motion. And you get uh, th through, you start with a motion which is of the size of this height of the convection zone. And then through nonlinear processes, you generate smaller and smaller scales. This is at least the conventional wisdom. And the smallest scale you can generate is of the art of a centimeter. So if you want to compute a flow, for instance, this kind of flow, the smallest resolution you ought to have is one centimeter. But you also want to be able to resolve something like 10 to the power 5 kilometers, which you can never do. So as I said, length and time scale ratios are of the order of 10 power 8. This is in one dimension. So three dimensions will be uh, 10 to the power 8 times 3, 10 to the power 24. And so it's not amenable to experiments. It's not amenable to simulations. So uh, what one can do is you can make some theoretical models, uh, starting with the so-called mixing length models. But you can also simulate some large scale parameters without really going into all this small structure in the flow. 
and uh, I will also try to explain, you can measure some parts of it. So the first question to ask is, what can the laboratory experiment say? Directly, not very much, as I said. One reason for that is, uh, is here. If you plot on um, a plane like this, the parental number on this axis, this is now uh, a logarithm to base 10, so it's a several orders of magnitude there. And the Rayleigh number on this axis, again, logarithm to base 10, going from somewhere about a million to, um, to all the way where we want to go. Each, fluid, each experiment is a dot on this diagram. So, um, and these lines here are the simulations uh, we made with uh, my uh, students at uh, one time. And these are the experiments we made with uh, Nimla and uh, Skrebek and Russ Donnelly, who is no more. So, in fact, these experiments go from about a million or so in Rayleigh number to about 10 to the power 17 or so. That's the largest range that uh, has anybody has done so far. My point of showing this diagram is, somehow, you look at this plane, it seems to be sort of crowded in this region and this region. So in fact, you can string a story of what is happening in convection in that part of the phase diagram. But the sun, however, has a Rayleigh number which is of that order and a Prandtl number of that order, which means the sun uh, really sits somewhere there, totally outside of the experience that anybody has so far in a laboratory, which is one good reason why you cannot tell what may be happening there in any detail. But there may be other reasons, other reasons um, um, being that the fluid with which one has any experience at all is much simpler than the kind of fluid that uh, sun has. But nevertheless, we know a lot about uh, what is happening in the laboratory. For example, if uh, you have a container like this, you are heating at the bottom and cooling at the top. Uh, the uh, heat is being convected from the bottom to the top. Somehow, by some uh, broken symmetry, uh, this kind of large scale gets established. A symmetry would have something like a donut or uh, some such structure. But that's not what actually happens. So you'll have some large scale structure that sort of seems to rotate in some detail. Sometimes this structure is uh, not touching the walls like here, but simply going more diagonally. So there are, and you can see such things um, in the numerical simulations, for example. And you can see that if it is not a, a circle, but a square, then these large scale circulations get set up along a corner, or along a diagonal in the apparatus. So we know that sort of stuff. We also know that these large scale circulations, which seem to keep going, reverse their directions, which is of some importance because the sun's magnetic field, as you know, reverses every, every 22 years, um, I think. Uh, I think 22 years. So uh, here is a, a illustration of how it reverses itself. For example, this is the velocity of this large scale motion as a function of time. This negative value suggests it's going one way, and the positive value suggests it's going the other way. So it's in one way, more or less, in this direction, changes the direction rather rapidly, and then seems to oscillate in some abrupt fashion, in some abrupt but random fashion. Unlike the sun, where it is very regular, and now this irregularity is characteristic of what happens for the Earth's magnetic field as well. What is South Pole today will become North Pole one of these days, and vice versa. Now, in fact, to study this for the sun, a convection was the means by which it was looked at. And uh, in a paper that was written uh, some years ago already by Glatzmeier and company, um, they uh, simulated convection and they found choosing among all these one that is most convenient for me, this diagram where you can see the, uh, the, the um, direction change of the magnetic field of the sun. So, so as I say, experiments don't tell you a lot in detail. They give you some framework within which to think. 
On the other hand, what do the modeling and simulations tell us? So the first attempt that was made was by Bohm Wittense. I put her picture up uh, because there are very few women in this field and it's always good to celebrate uh, something like that. Uh, she developed a theory whose origins were uh, in a classical fluid dynamics in 1915 and 1921. Um, and the general idea is if you have a turbulent motion, this theory, this particular theory thinks that there's only one scale of motion in the whole fluid. And that scale you can think of as these eddies, these parcels of fluid which move about in the flow. And you imagine that they all have only one length scale. They're all the same type of balls. And then they traverse a certain distance with their properties intact. But once they move a certain distance, they sort of mix with the neighborhood and, and give away all their properties to the neighborhood. So that's the general idea of this so-called mixing length. And if you make such argument for this flow, and you don't know this mixing length a priori, but you assume it is related to the pressure scale height, that is the height of height over which the density changes, let's say, by one over E or something like that. Um, and then you will get some results. And, but one knows now that this one scale model is, of course, not right. There are many, many scales in the flow. They all interact together. And there are more complex models which I will describe in a brief minute, uh, will tell you that some details are not consistent with, the, with this model. It's not very surprising that it is not consistent. On the other hand, what is surprising is how persistent the influence of this model has been in trying to explain many phenomena that occur in the sun. It's a very simple model, simple-minded one. And um, I put in a picture which unfortunately is not clear. But this is how certain properties vary along the radius of the sun in the convection region. And we know that um, uh, the, on the surface, they are roughly right. Of this, this one in particular, because these all go to zero. Um, this is the velocity of the fluid. But sort of the whole uh, parameter has been adjusted to give you the right value that you can observe on the surface of the sun. So it really is not verifiable in any detail. There are other, other models, um, uh, simulations, as I said. These simulations, as I already said, cannot be faithful to the flow. They cannot be faithful to the flow because um, they have limited bandwidth, the simulations, even if you use the world's largest computer. And um, uh, whereas the flow itself has many scales. As I said, the ratio of the largest to the smallest could be of the order of 10 to the power 8. Now, um, um, the most famous among them are the so-called ash simulations. Ash meaning um, unelastic spherical harmonics. And that's the uh, acronym. Unelastic means it's an approximation that you make to the equations of motion, assuming that the flow is not moving anywhere near to the close to the speed of sound. And so you sort of perturb the equations on the, in this parameter called the Mach number, and you keep the second uh, approximation, second order approximation, which gives you this unelastic approximation. And uh, what they do is right. They go from this ratio 0.7 to 0.98, which is not, which is almost the edge of the sun. Um, but in order to make it plausible, make it uh, workable, they use a viscosity which varies from a number like this to a number like that, which is approximately 12 to 25 orders of magnitude larger than the sun's. I mean, if you do it like this, what happens is that you sort of um, try to kill off these fluctuations, which are of um, larger, uh, which are still very large, keeping only the very largest scales in the flow. And those fluctuations are associated with the small axis of that. That's correct. Yeah. The, that's correct. And they use a Prandtl number, which is. Small. 
they use a Prandtl number a quarter. So the parameters are not right, and it just makes it manageable. Where this is like the, um, if I'm slightly ungenerous, it's like the um, the the well-known uh, person who was looking for the thing he lost somewhere where the light was, rather than where it might have been lost. But the, as I said, it's an ungenerous remark um, because. I actually think they show many interesting remarks, interesting features of the flow, and I will tell you what the differential rotation is and meridional circulation is, etc. But it also has many other uh, negative features. There are also other calculations uh, which are which are uh, uh, being done by others. Now, the question is, how do these simulation results compare with observations, and what observations are possible? I already said you can only see what is on the surface of the sun, but you have to somehow be able to at least tell whether the numbers that people compute make any sense at all or not. So that's uh, um, the part in which I have been involved in. And this is the so-called helioseismology about which you probably know. So uh, to, as an introduction, sun is opaque to electromagnetic radiation in the sense that uh, because the matter is so dense in the core of the sun and also in the radiation region, um, every photon uh, um, uh, has collisions, many collisions, and it takes a very long time to come out. And in fact, you can make uh, some kind of Brownian uh, motion uh, type calculations, and it takes hundreds of thousands of years for, the, for a photon to escape from the from the internal region to the outside. Uh, however, the sun is very transparent to the acoustic waves. And what are these acoustic waves and how do we use them is the next part of it. And of course, it's also transparent to neutrinos, but I'm not going to talk about that part. So, um, so how are these acoustic waves seen in the sun? Let's imagine you have a shell of some sort and you hit it occasionally with, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, with, a, uh, with sand, sand particles or something like that. Just bombard them with sand particles. Then sound is created, and the sound is trapped inside, the, inside this shell. And the same way, uh, the acoustic waves you can imagine are created. You have a surface of the sun. Um, which is sort of impervious to the, uh, to the matter moving out. And the convection really keeps these, um, these parcels of fluid coming and hitting the surface of the sun. It creates some sound waves. And sun acts as a resonator to these, uh, to these waves. And you will see a standing wave pattern. And the surface continually resonates. So I have uh, a picture that is taken from uh, NASA uh, satellites, uh, which uh, tell you how the uh, the acoustic re resonance takes place. And this is just observation on the, on the sun. And you filter out all the wavelengths, uh, keep only the acoustic part. And uh, this is how it looks. Um, so the oscillations are obviously small, but you can see them. You can see here much better than you can see on the, on the edge, but that's because the projection issues. But basically, that is the kind of oscillations that exists in the sun, the acoustic oscillations. And as I said, these oscillations are produced because of the fluid motion inside the sun. So, um, so the whole question now is uh, how uh, you might observe these acoustic oscillations um, and then infer the properties of the flow that created them in the first place. So the standard problem would be, if I knew what the flow was, then I could create these, I could calculate these acoustic oscillations and be a direct problem. But here, what I have is the so-called indirect or inverse problem, where I want to know something about what happens inside the sun by observing the oscillations on the surface. That's the whole, whole thing. It's not, as I said uh, here, not unique, uh, but it gives you some very interesting information. So to elaborate on this a little bit more, suppose and think of these as these acoustic waves as rays rather than wave fronts. Um, so here is an acoustic wave 
that's coming into the sun, it gets refracted because the density changes, and then it hits the sun surface again at B, and then it goes on and on in that fashion. Now, if this fluid in the sun was stationary, nothing was moving, then if an acoustic wave traveled from A to B or from B to A, it would take identical amount of time. It's traversing exactly the same path with nothing moving. On the other hand, if the fluid were moving, let's say in this direction, when the acoustic wave is going from A to B, it gets a certain kick, it, it, gets, uh, it gets to move faster than the wave that, uh, the ray that runs from B to A. So if I know somehow the difference between the propagation times between A and B and B and A, I would be able to tell how fast the fluid was moving. I mean, that's the general idea. There are many steps in it. Uh, in general, uh, it, the pulse, the acoustic pulse may be like that. This may be going from one direction and this may be going the other direction. I may take the principal feature like the largest peak and to calculate how much time um, it is in going from A to B and B to A and take the difference between the two of them. So like this, as I said, any flow break symmetry. So calculate the time difference and the time difference must be proportional to the velocity. And of course, this proportionality constant is very important for us and you have to sort of know what that is. And that is done usually by developing some model for the, for the sun and then computing it uh, for certain uh, types of pulsations you put by hand and getting that number and taking the same number for, uh, for uh, the uh, real sun. So a little bit more uh, by detail. You, of course, don't measure these temperature, these time differences in that fashion, but you take a cross-correlation between these two signals and you sort of know when the cross-correlation peaks and it is related to the speed of, uh, of speed of convection. Another way to look at it is, uh, this is the sun surface, and let's say I want to measure the properties or the flow speed here. Uh, this is essentially the same as I said before, A to B and B to A, and I have a speed, etc. So I want to measure the speed here. Uh, imagine a ray that goes from here that's going through this point and emerging, emerging here. So if I measure the time difference, as I, as I tried to explain earlier, what it would tell you is an accumulated uh, information about the speed of the flow along its entire path. Now, if I take another one like that, also going through here, the difference will tell me the history of the flow along its path. And now I have many of these, and I average them all. That tells me the velocity at uh, that point. I mean, that's the general principle. And what you find, this is the interesting part. Uh, there were many estimates uh, actually at that time, at the time we wrote this paper, which was 2012. The thing that is called ash was what was available. But we found if I plot the energy of these oscillations, spherically decomposed, and I have the spherical harmonic degree uh, here. Um, these are large scales. These are small, small in, in some sense. Uh, the ash simulations showed that the energy in these units was something like 10 to the power uh, 1 or 10 to the power 2, whereas the, the seismology results were somewhere between 10 power minus 1 and 10 power minus 2. So this is about two to three hours of magnitude difference in energy, which means um, um, uh, one to one and a half hour of magnitude difference in velocity. Now that actually surprised a lot of people. And so different people started measuring uh, things. As you can see, uh, some of them have begun to approach in this direction, but still uh, there is a not, a not uh, enough convergence on this. At that time we wrote this, uh, we were actually quite uh, pleased to hear remarks like this. This was uh, perhaps the most important work on helioseismology, etc. But the more interesting thing is that, in fact, 
um, maybe this part. The sun transport energy through convection zone while maintaining very low amplitude large scale motions is of great, uh, uh, great, uh, uh, it simplifies things a lot and these separate lines of evidence all suggest the same, same thing. So, we were quite uh, pleased about this remark. Um, but uh, it does not mean the problem is by any means understood in the sense that people had created various models to understand about the transport using the previously known velocities. Now, if you say the velocities ought to be about 10 times smaller or 30 times smaller, now how exactly do you reconcile all these things? I think that is the main part that is still under discussion and I want to say a little bit about that. Now, wh why would the velocity be so much smaller compared to some simulations even though you might say you trust these simulations? There are many reasons or at least two I can point out. One of them is that the density uh, changes enormously from one position to another position in the sun. In an experiment, a fluid which, can, which has let us say water or, or air or something like that, the density changes are not very large and we are used to creating conditions where the density changes are not very large. In fact, we know how to correct for them if the density changes are slightly different. But in this case, they vary by several orders of magnitude and one does not have any intuition whatever. Furthermore, the sun is rotating and uh, what the effect does the rotation have is something one ought to know. So, here is one experiment where you plot here the Rossby number so called, uh, this, is, this is speed of rotation and this is how much heat is transported. Noting that these numbers are really all in third decimal place you can say that the effect is very negligible. It is hardly any uh, effect at all on the heat transport at least. Whereas, the structure of the flow could be quite different and I want to ask myself how uh, fast is the sun rotating? It's not, we know exactly how fast it rotates in, in numbers like uh, so many days for one rotation, but I want to have an idea of how it compares with the rest of the fluid properties. That is the Rossby number. So, I plot here the, uh, all the experiments that are known in the, in the literature as a, this Rayleigh number on this axis and 1 over the Rossby number that means this is all fast rotating flows, this is all slow rotating flows, this is a relatively weak convection, relatively strong convection. And as you can see experiments, experimentalists do what is most convenient that is to uh, cover the range where it is possible to do and which is all concentrated in this region. The experiments that uh, I just mentioned, the ones previously were our experimental data which really stretch the range by uh, orders of magnitude on uh, that is what I call our data. Now, you want to know where the sun resides on this plot. Uh, different parts of the uh, sun uh, plot at different positions on this plot. For example, if you took at the granules we saw earlier on the surface, you know the movie I showed where there were oscillating granules. If I take the length scale of that and plot the, um, the Rossby number that would uh, be here somewhere way down and so the rotation effects are negligible and all that happens is really some general dynamics without rotation. On the other hand, if I take the so called super granules which are granules that are several times larger um, whose dynamics one does not fully understand. It plots here, again rotation is not as important because you are still talking about a uh, Rossby number of the order of 0.1 or 0.2. Whereas, if I take the traditional estimate of velocity for the sun in estimating the Rossby number, I put in such a big symbol not because I was lazy because you do not know these parameters that well, so I gave some uncertainty to the data by just showing bigger symbols. Uh, you will get a Rossby number which is like that, which means it is sort of in the border, you know, it is somewhere of the order uh, 1 or so, maybe a little bit more than 1, therefore a little bit less than 1, so rotation is important, but maybe not. But you remember I showed that the helioseismology results tell you that the velocity is about an order of magnitude 
are in one and a half orders of magnitude smaller, which puts the, um, which puts the uh, point there, a point within quotation marks. So it tells me that the rotation rate is very important uh, for the sun, and therefore I have to really consider uh, the rotation uh, in trying to understand how the effect, how it might affect, um, affect the uh, flow. And here is uh, a simulation done by Nick Featherstone, um, small uh, simulation, nothing uh, like the sun, but still uh, intended to uh, shed some light on it. Here again, the spherical harmonic degree um, uh, plotted here, the power, he calls it velocity power, but it doesn't matter. So this would be a spectrum of the energy in the fluctuations, would be like that. If you rotate it um, with the Rossby number 0 0.028, it will be here. That is, some range of scales, the large scales are affected by rotation, but thereafter, it doesn't seem to have any effect. And if you rotate it faster, um, it will again uh, have the same influence, but larger. And you can see that this point where um, uh, the break occurs from the traditional one moves to the right, the faster you rotate, and according to this, uh, uh, this uh, diagram. So that's uh, uh, consistent with, uh, with all the stuff. But rotation has another very important thing. I just uh, not uh, tell you everything about this. But basically, I said in my very first slide that if you increase the temperature difference between the top and bottom plates, the fluid starts to move and it starts to move at some critical value of the Rayleigh number, which is typically of the order of a few thousand for, the, uh, for this box that I showed earlier. But for if you rotate things fast, it could very well remain um, non-turbulent until much higher Rayleigh numbers. For example, on, uh, for each of these flows which corresponds to different degrees of rotation, it remains um, sort of non-turbulent until higher and higher Rayleigh number. For example, for something like a sun which sits there, it could very well be that the flow is not even turbulent at Rayleigh numbers of the art of 10 to the power 20. So it, rotation has many important effects. One other important effect it has is that um, if rotation were, um, were really, really uh, critical, um, the the angular momentum of the fluid will remain constant along columns like this, so-called Taylor-Proudman columns, and this is a theorem that you can actually prove. So very deep motions which have very low Rayleigh numbers where the rotation is very strong, you might expect something like this. And on the outside where the Rossby number is uh, large, you might expect something like that. But actually, um, that may, that's all very fine in terms of uh, trying to wave one's hand um, uh, vigorously. But uh, there are many questions that one have to answer. And I will ask a few questions and uh, try to um, you know, speculate on, uh, on the answers uh, to them. Um, I have to say that I don't know the answers to these questions. Um, but uh, in my defense, I don't know that anyone actually knows them um, either. So let's talk about uh, this here. How is heat transported uh, despite weak convection and weak Reynolds stresses? So uh, the sun always um, transports a certain amount of energy, whether you like it or not, whether you can calculate it or not. Um, there's a certain amount of nuclear energy that's produced and it's radiated outwards. And the models that people had constructed always assumed the velocities of a certain magnitude, and therefore there was some understanding of how that was being done. Now imagine that the helioseismology result is right. Um, there are several reasons why it could not be right, but nevertheless, let's proceed on that assumption. If you say they are 30 to 100 times slower, or how does the sun actually, uh, uh, what's the mechanism by which the, by which the heat transport is performed? So that's the first question. Now, um, 
the convection is also supposed to be very important to explain the so called differential rotation. What is a differential rotation? Now, that is the one quadrant of the sun and the sun is rotating around here this axis and it turns out that the sun uh, the, the part interior to this dashed line is rotating like a solid body. Um, whereas, on the outside different layers of fluid rotate at different speeds. This is the so called differential rotation. This diagram is telling you that if you measure the rotation rate of the sun at, as a function of the distance from the, from the center which is some, which will be somewhere here up to about 0.7 for different latitudes the rotation rate is the same. Whereas, beyond this until the edge of the uh, sun uh, different latitudes rotate at different speeds. The, the equator rotates much faster compared to let us say at uh, 75 degrees as you go towards the pole. This differential rotation um, uh, which is a very important thing for uh, things like magnetic field. Now, somehow uh, has to be understood uh, has to be understood because it is related the, the source of this differential rotation is eventually convection because there is no other motion that is possible. And so, you have to sort of explain with smaller velocities how you maintain the same kind of differential rotation. So, um, that is one question. The other question is, so how is the meridional circulation maintained? Which, what is meant by meridional circulation? That is uh, shown here. So, this is the sun, you have taken a cut through the sun and this is 7 tenths the radius here somewhere and, uh, the, radius and the edge of the sun and there is this motion from the equator to the pole on the um, near the skin of the sun and to compensate for that you have a motion from the pole to the equator uh, somewhere down and uh, this is uh, symmetric on, on the sides. Again this too has eventually the origin coming from, uh, coming from the convective motion in, in the sun. So, all of this has to be explained. And, uh, So, um, uh, the, there is a uh, lot of it is modeling, modeling of what is happening in the sun. And so, there is a kind of self consistent story that tries to explain all these things and none of them is pretty firm because there are connections you have to make and the intuition one has is from lower Rayleigh number simulations and modeling. Now, once the one key parameter is now set askew that is you have to explain all this with uh, one thirtieth of your uh, values and how do you do that is the question. And so, th that is the question for which as I say I do not have all the answers, but I have some kind of answers. Um, I can spend uh, a lot of time on uh, just giving you too much speculation, but the most important of all is the how is the magnetic flux transport maintained from uh, presumably from inside the sun to the outside. This is gives you what gives you sunspots and it um, uh, has many interesting properties, but I will not I will as I said this is the first question I actually asked in the beginning, but I am not going to answer any of this, but let us look at a little bit of the of the other two. Um, so, the best explanation that one has of how the uh, heat is transported despite small velocities is it is not at all like the classical turbulent motion at all. It is not like classical turbulent motion where you have large structures baking up into smaller structures and smaller structures and, and things of that sort, but you have something of the kind of plumes, plumes um, that are that begin to descend from uh, the surface of the sun all the way to the, uh, to the bottom of the convection region called the tacho line and with little mixing. So, it actually just uh, goes from top to bottom very efficient way of, uh, of uh, uh, convecting um, the property that it carries. And you can make calculations uh, 
it does not mix with the rest of the ambient thing, although it entrains so much, because it has huge stratification. It's always moving to region of higher and higher density, which basically means it is being um, always kept intact. And so um, that is one way it will do it. And uh, a rising flow would be diffuse. This is a, a matter of detail. So the question is uh, whether this model can explain why, uh, in spite of the weak velocities in the flow, it accomplishes about the same amount of transport that you would have, uh, uh, you would have seen with large velocities had the motion been classically turbulent. So that's one uh, model, and there has been some calculations made on it. Now, how is the differential rotation maintained? That is to say, the fluid is always in classical convection, going up radially or coming down radially, more or less. But differential rotation now means that each latitude is rotating at a, a certain speed. So you have to somehow convert this uh, motion that is radial into something that is along the, along the latitudes. Now, uh, here, it helps to know that the velocities are very small, which means the balance between different forces in the equation of the motion is quite different from the classical turbulent motion. It's called the geostrophic approximation in this case. And it turns out uh, it's just a balance between the centrifugal forces and the, and the, mm, and, um, the pressure gradient. And so if you make such a balance, you can actually show that this radial motion has more easily, has a greater propensity to become uh, in the direction of the differential motion. And of course, I didn't try to answer this uh, meridional circulation because it's very hard to know uh, to make any model of this. Even for others, it's been very difficult because it's not been uh, established very clearly what the magnitudes are, whether it actually exists, although it must exist, one imagines, because of the properties of the magnetic field. So in some sense, um, I want to summarize it like this. The convection zone in the sun is thought to be important for solar dynamo, solar flares, space weather if you are into applications, um, and uh, laboratory experiments, simulations, and models present a particular partial picture of convection. And uh, helioseismology data suggest that the large-scale convection in the sun is weaker than previously thought. And of course, some people are quite pleased with it because it seems to uh, explain certain things they uh, had difficulty with. Uh, but some are not exactly accepting it, as you might imagine. So there is still uh, work to be done on this. Um, and this has posed difficult, but some kind of transformational questions in how one thinks about it. Unfortunately, um, by we, I mean I don't know well enough all the details to string a plausible story for you that's quantitatively consistent. I can qualitatively string a story that uh, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. But in order to be convincing, I have to make a quantitative story. And I haven't done it. And it just it's not been that easy to make such a quantitative story. So despite uh, some serious work and considerable progress, I must uh, confess to enormous ignorance. But, uh, but I think, uh, uh, I hope it's interesting to you. It's certainly been interesting to me. I learned a lot of uh, new things in the last few years. Thank you very much. Thank you.